and gentlemen, to Great Decisions 2021, an eight lecture masterclass brought to you by the Foreign Policy Association. Each year, the FPA selects eight challenges or great decisions facing America's elected officials and the public. In support of the Great Decisions program, the FPA produces a television series, which is available on DVD, and a print guide called the Great Decisions Handbook. For information about these materials, please visit fpa.org or simply Google Great Decisions. The 2021 topics are global supply chains, Persian Gulf security, Brexit, the mounting Arctic, China in Africa, the two Koreas, the World Health Organization in the age of pandemics, and a perennial question, is this the end of globalization? At any time during the presentation, please feel free to navigate to the Q&A tab to post a question, which I will address at the conclusion of the lecture. On to the first topic, global supply chains. Now, this is a highly specialized topic, very narrow. It's the sort of concept that you might run across in an undergraduate textbook on business management. But it is a subset of a broader policy concern, namely our relationship with China, which is in and of itself a relatively modest portion of a much larger discussion, America's global economic strategy. This evening, we'll look at all of these levels for our policy considerations. However, we begin with the assigned topic. Most any object that you purchase, whether it is something sophisticated like an iPhone or something relatively basic like an article of clothing, we can trace back all the way to the point of origin that product's development. And across the way, we are traveling over international boundaries, thus creating a global supply chain. In reality, the supply chain is more complicated than the graph that you are looking at, because at each of these points of production and assembly, there are subsidiary supply chains, oftentimes international as well. The already fragile global supply chain is made even more so by the just-in-time strategy that dominates management thinking. What managers would like to see is the components of the product arrive just in time for assembly and production before moving along to the next stage. As a result, a disruption anywhere in the supply chain can wreak havoc on the scheduled delivery of the product. It could be a natural disaster, such as a hurricane or an earthquake. It could be a political decision a new government or maybe a new direction in economic policy, or it could be most any sort of union strike or delay in the movement of goods from one point to another. This results in disruptions along the global supply chain. And of course, we have all been there. You go to look for that perfect item, maybe a gift for a special person, maybe it's something that you need for work or for play and it simply is not available. It all boils down to supply and demand. If the supply and demand meet in the middle of a graph, that's called a condition of equilibrium. And at this point, consumers can purchase items at a reasonable price and producers can sell them at a reasonable profit. But if there is either a decline in supply or an increase in demand, our point on the graph changes, resulting in the increase of the price of that good. According to classic economic theory, we don't need a government intervention to create equilibrium. The higher price point results in new suppliers and thus we are moved back to the proper point. The price drops and everything is in equilibrium. But what we saw beginning roughly one year ago was that some supplies, these are commodities that aren't matters of convenience, but health and quite literally life and death simply could not be provided fast enough. The demand skyrocketed well beyond any ability to supply 
the world's market. And that, of course, was the result of the novel coronavirus. COVID-19 devastated the supply chains, causing all sorts of disruptions in some of our most basic functions in life. This is what a supply crisis looks like. The demand is overwhelming the supply. And no matter how many market forces are at work or how much government intervention is deployed, there's not going to be a balancing of supply and demand. And thus we experience this as we look for essential commodities in response to the global challenge of the pandemic. It isn't simply the masks that we desperately needed and were out of supply. It was also the surgical gloves. It was the gowns that our frontline workers need to properly protect themselves in dealing with people with the virus. It was also the ventilators, which are absolutely essential to saving people's lives and even the vaccines. Now, granted, it may not be that we need a global supply chain for the vaccine itself. Many countries did develop their own COVID-19 vaccine. But what about the bottles and the caps on the bottles, the labels on the bottles, the syringes, the ability to transport the virus vaccine? All of this means that global supply chain disruption can result in national security questions. Hi, Jeffrey. Sorry, sorry to interrupt for just a moment. We're just getting a few notes that uh, some people, uh, the volume isn't high enough on their machines. So if there's any way you can, can try and speak up, that would be fantastic. Uh, thank you. From the control room, I'm asked to speak a little bit louder for those who are having difficulty hearing me, and I'll do my best to do that. The China supply crisis for PPE. Prior to COVID, we can look at a country's needs as it relates to its domestic production. So this is the United States. And as you can see, our needs are represented in the blue circle. Our domestic production of gloves, of masks, of gowns and the like was significantly less than the country's needs. But that was perfectly fine because a central component of global economic thinking is called comparative advantage. Accordingly, a country doesn't need to produce everything that its citizens needs. It should rather produce what it's most profitable at. It can then trade that item and with the money purchase items that its citizens need. So as you can see with China, its production of masks and gowns and gloves was significantly larger than the domestic demand. And thus we received a supply from China so that everyone who wanted a mask two, three years ago could easily have one. COVID of course changed everything because our demand skyrocketed. It wasn't just the United States, every country in the world saw a dramatic increase in the demand for basic commodities like masks, including China. And as much as we tried to increase our production of these personal protective equipment, we weren't able to keep up with our own domestic demand. China's production increased to the point that it was actually overproducing, and yet its supply was reduced to the United States. And what China was doing was sending these critically needed commodities to third parties, to other countries. This is called COVID diplomacy. And it's a very good way for China to sort of cover over the fact that COVID began in its country. This graph indicates the extent to which countries are dependent upon China in their supply chains. And as you will note from the colored graph, the United States is at a very high end of the scale, 35% or more. In fact, many of the most critically needed commodities to confront the COVID crisis are coming through China at a clip of 90 to 95%. And that includes ventilators. Here you can see a pretty typical problem we've been facing for the past year or so, simply out of masks and out of hand sanitizers and, and all the other basic things that can keep us safe and sound from the virus. We also had a shortage in toilet paper. Now, this is a bit odd because toilet paper really isn't a necessity even in the age of COVID, 
But this is something that happens every time there is a global supply chain disruption or a shortage in a commodity. For example, in 1973, OPEC nations bound together their cartel embargoed oil to the Western world. This created a small recession in Western Europe and North America. It also made people fear for basic commodities and there was a toilet paper run in 1973. So there doesn't have to be a connection between the shortage and the demand for bathroom tissue. In fact, last February to March, there was a 700% jump in consumer demand and purchase for toilet paper. I was not a marketing major, but I can't imagine ever thinking that this would be a good idea of advertisement for a restaurant. Come into our restaurant, eat our food, and we'll give you free toilet paper. Such is the nature of advertising. We are incredibly vulnerable to Chinese supplies. It's not just the PPE is also critically important components of our military, our aircraft and our tanks. It is the automobiles that we drive. It is the microprocessors and computer chips. We've seen a dramatic increase in demand for computer chips since last February when COVID really began to affect our daily lives, mainly because people, if they're going to be stuck at home, decided to buy more computers and handheld devices and games for the kids. And that really took a lot of the microprocessors and computer chips off the market. So here we are in March of 2021, approaching the period, and our automobile industry is grinding to a halt because they don't have enough processors to go into the cars. Cars today take between 25 and 50 computer chips. General Motors announced just today that they're looking at a $2 billion shortfall in revenue because of slowed production as a result of the supply chain just cannot keep up with the demand for the computer chips. It's the devices that we take for granted, the iPhones, the handheld devices. It is our public transportation system. Uh, Many of the components of our train system, for example, come to us from abroad, including from China. If we don't have access to those critical components, we simply cannot continue to offer public transportation. And if there's any industry that as a percentage is more dependent on China for the supply of its parts, its pieces, and its finished products, it's probably the medical industry. This is our electrical grid. We struggle as a nation to deliver enough energy to all of our citizens and all of our territory 12 months a year. In fact, it's not unusual in the dog days of summer in August and September to have rolling brownouts in the American Midwest and on the West Coast. Many of the components of our electrical grid come to us from China. Imagine if China decided to boycott the export or simply reduce the number of exports, establish an export quota on the US for its electrical grid components. That could lead to a very real crisis and an economic downturn in our nation. Supplies have gone global, especially over the course of the past 50 to 75 years. We can look at our country, for example, our domestic supply as it relates to our foreign supply of goods that we consume. And it wasn't terribly long ago, maybe two or three generations, that here in the United States, we could produce almost everything that we needed. You can see a very small sliver of yellow in that that diagram. Well, that's the foreign supply. But as we've evolved, as we've become more sophisticated as an economy, as our consumers have become more demanding in the volume of products that they will use, there's been an enormous gap that has been created. So that today we don't supply our own commodities at the clip we used to. And as you can see from this graph, we are now highly dependent on foreign markets. This global supply chain has become a bloodline for the American economy 
and for our fellow citizens. So what is going on? Why is it that the United States is so dependent on foreign markets and supplies for basic commodities? One of the reasons is that we are a high consumption modern society. We are no different than Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Western Europe, Canada to the north, and increasingly Mexico to the south. As an economy grows, as people become more wealthy, they have greater expendable capacity, and they very often do expend that extra money. Secondly, a very strong desire for white collar careers. Very few of us advise our children and grandchildren to work in construction or to go into the coal mines or to try to work in a textile industry. A shockingly small percentage of Americans put a shovel in the ground, even though a century or two ago, we were largely an agrarian society. And so if everyone is working in the service industry, we simply aren't producing as many goods as our society is demanding. The calculation, placing profits over people, we don't like to think of it that way, but that really is the rationale for moving so many jobs abroad. People who are in charge of large industries, they know full well that if they relocate south of the border or to Asia, they will be making unemployed large numbers of people. But that profit motive is very real. And for publicly held companies, it's hard to blame the CEO for doing everything within her or his power to maximize profits and to result in a quarterly bottom line that is always in the positive. There's also the reality that our global trading system has become more legal and freer by virtue of the many different accords and treaties that we have signed. The LIEO is the Liberal International Economic Order. Don't let the word liberal throw you. In American politics, a liberal is normally someone who believes the government should intervene in the economy, perhaps redistributing wealth and even opportunity. But in economic terms, a liberal is Adam Smith. A liberal is a capitalist, a free marketer. So when we say liberal international economic order, we're speaking of a free trade system that was created by and directed by the United States following World War II. And then finally, something we simply cannot overlook is the extraordinarily high production coming out of Asia. When you have a region of the world producing so many widgets and gidgets, VCRs and automobiles, articles of clothing, you're going to rely upon them to provide you with their commodities, especially given that in those countries, oftentimes there aren't the same labor laws. There aren't the same environmental regulations. There isn't always social security taxes abroad and unions are oftentimes illegal. So there's an enormous advantage to the producers outside the United States. Here you can see the decline of American production as it relates to jobs in industry. Uh, you'll note that since 2000, there's been a rather significant decline, a little bit of a rally following 2010, but still the numbers are relatively bleak. We don't need to see charts. We've all seen images such as this, areas of the Midwest that are, that are rotting, that are rusting to the core, the textile industry, the steel industry, Many of these towns have now been abandoned because the good jobs are gone. Most of them have been outsourced. A very popular book was written and published in 2016, Hillbilly Elegy by J.D. Vance. This is his story. Vance was born in Kentucky. And like so many others, his family followed the Miami River up into Ohio where they settled and it wasn't a very pleasant life. It's Appalachia. And there have been many, many books, and as you can see here, a movie on Netflix from J.D. Vance's book that chronicle the struggles of people in areas such as this. 
Now, the Vance thesis, which is pretty common among people who have literally pulled themselves up by the bootstraps, people who have made a good life for themselves, they often say, if I could do it, then anyone could. And his argument is that people are a product of the decisions that they have made. So Vance decided to get serious, to go all the way through high school, to join the military, then go off to college and become a well-respected attorney. And he argues other people could have made the very same choices. They didn't have to choose to drop out of high school, to fall into alcoholism and substance abuse. What J.D. Vance misses is that so many of these people's lives were literally ripped out from underneath them. Just look at the millions of lives that have been outsourced, hundreds of thousands to multiple countries. This is something that is a reality of world politics. And it's a reality of the evolution of America's economy. We were once agrarian, we became industrial. We entered into post-industrial economic status and today we're largely a service sector economy. Some 72% of the US economy is made up by service sector jobs and service sector activities. Many of our industrial and production jobs have simply been outsourced to other countries. And it's relatively easy for a politician or even more so an economist to say, well, if all those coal miners lose their jobs in West Virginia and all of those textile workers in North Carolina become unemployed, they'll have to retool. They'll have to learn a new trade. This is much easier said than done because in more traditional communities, it's not just a job, it's a way of life. And what you do reflects not only your own ethos, but a social ethos of your community. So when the major industries go under, everyone can't just go off to the local community college and learn how to code for computer programming. It's simply not that simple. So what the economist and the politician should say is that yes, people are losing their jobs as our economy and our society evolves. And those, those jobs won't be easily replaced, but in the aggregate, more Americans will get jobs given the opportunities presented by a truly global international economy. So what's next in the United States? What's industry may just go away and go away forever. We know the textile industry has been devastated by outsourcing, by free trade agreements, by lower labor standards and cost of production abroad. We know the steel industry has been devastated as well. The question is, can you imagine what might be next? Is it possible that here in the United States, the country that invented automobiles, that perfected the muscle car, where cars play such an incredibly important role in our romantic version of our country and its development? Is it possible that it is next? Could we be a country that no longer makes automobiles? I mean, that would be a significant blow to many jobs. About one sixth of all American jobs are linked directly or indirectly to the automobile industry. Now granted, they're not all in production. Many of them are in sales and marketing and finance and the like, but it would be rather shocking to, to think of a time when the United States is no longer producing that one commodity that we can all agree upon is essentially an American ideal. Next on the horizon, probably electronic vehicles. EVs are all the rage these days. The world production chain is having a difficult time keeping up with the growing demand. Increasingly, municipalities and, and governors, even US presidents are talking about moving beyond fossil fuel driven automobiles and adopting an EV standard. President Biden, new on the job, has already announced his plan to move the US into electric vehicles for the federal vehicle fleet system. And General Motors, it's already announced in 2035, only 14 years away, it's gonna zero out fossil fuel. 
automobiles. It's going to go completely with zero emission vehicles. And that means, of course, EVs and, and other technologies. Can we do that? There are many who argue if any nation can lead the way in technology and development in new ideas and sophistication of automobiles, it should be the United States. The challenge, however, is that we still will be dependent on other countries. We cannot produce enough in the United States to efficiently, effectively, cost-effectively provide vehicles that are electric. If you look at lithium, and of course, batteries are primarily lithium, this is a wonderful invention. These are batteries that hold full charge until the very end. They're very rapid in recharging. They're essential for any electric vehicle. The overwhelming percentage of lithium products are shipped out of Chile and China. So don't be surprised when, when leadership in companies like Tesla are in Chile and in China negotiating deals to acquire the lithium that they will desperately need to keep their production rolling. So even if we're at the forefront of the technological breakthroughs, we can invent the perfect electronic car that has zero emission, and yet we're still reliant upon a global supply chain. Let's look at the international treaties that have really fueled the globalization of world politics since 1945, but especially since the Cold War ended and fundamentally changed our relationship with other countries as it relates to the supply of goods. Now, these deals have been drafted in a cumulative fashion, meaning we reach a bilateral deal with one country and then a multilateral deal with a group of countries and as we move forward, bringing more and more countries into our trade deals, we're seeing the cumulative effect that more and more of the world is committed to free trade. As a result of that, our producers have access to greater amounts of foreign products and locations for production, which means we're going to be shipping more products into the United States. Manufacturing jobs, therefore, will be in decline because we simply cannot compete with the low wage structure in developing nations. Our appetite for free trade, how much do Americans support international free trade? The high point at the immediate aftermath of World War II, it was in 1944, in fact, before World War II was over, that the United States invited the world to New England, and it was there that we introduced our liberal economic order, a free trade system with access to American markets. If we fast forward 50 years to 1994, NAFTA is a regional free trade agreement, bringing one country to the north that essentially is the mirror reflection of the United States with our neighbor to the south, which is much poorer Mexico, into an agreement, the Clinton administration barely got this through Congress by about one vote margin, in fact. And so what we have seen over time is a steady decline in American public support for free trade agreements. And it's not that the United States is opposed to the idea of free trade, it's the feeling that free trade isn't fair, that if we're gonna provide pensions and working salaries, if we're gonna provide social security benefits, healthcare, the trade isn't very fair with countries that don't provide those services. I've heard many people say in the last four years that President Donald Trump basically turned America against free trade. And that just isn't the case. He was riding a wave. He recognized early on, well back into the 1980s, that America was souring in his trade relationship with Japan at the time and China later. So he took advantage of the declining American appetite for free trade to call for some pretty radical changes in our free trade agreements. Arguing on the campaign trail that NAFTA was the single worst treaty ever drafted and that he would either end it or fundamentally change it. And he did indeed change it. Here you can see 
the leadership of Canada, the United States, and Mexico signing off on the newer version of NAFTA. This is without doubt a foreign policy success because the new NAFTA is better than the old NAFTA. It's 25 years newer, and that means it takes into account many of the new realities of the global economy. I mean, imagine when NAFTA was first drafted in the early 1990s, there really wasn't much of an internet uh, and, and so much of the things that we look at today as common weren't yet available then. And so this upgrade in NAFTA was a strong move for the Trans-Pacific Partnership. This is an Obama crafted piece of legislation, an international accord that tied the United States to a multitude of countries in the Pacific, South American, in the Pacific, and over in East Asia, Donald Trump decided that was a bridge too far. And he signed an executive order that effectively withdrew the United States from membership in the TPP. It remains to be seen how Joe Biden will address the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Every four years, a politician comes along running for high office, maybe the House, the Senate, or even the presidency, and they'll talk about their commitment to American jobs, to bringing back those good, high paying jobs with benefits in classic industries. But there's very little fanfare. The trend lines are incredibly clear. Here you can see employment expectations over a 10 year period. And if you look at the very bottom of the graph, manufacturing is projected to be a net loser in jobs. And so that tells you is it may be easy on a political level to promise to bring back jobs. It's a much more difficult thing to actually pull off. All right, we've thought a lot about global supply chains and we've talked a bit about China. Let's look now at the big picture, America's global economic strategy. And this is a meaningful debate because on one end of the spectrum, we have the policies of mercantilism. And on the other, we have the policies associated with capitalism and free trade, and then all of the points in between. China functions like a mercantilist nation. Its government plays a very heavy handed role in directing the economy, essentially picking the winners and doing away with the losers. And in so doing, China is able to promote a maximization of exports to the rest of the world and minimize imports to the best of its ability. No nation is insulated from international trade, but there are varying degrees of dependency and China does its best to reduce its dependency upon foreign markets. As a result of these policies, China is able to accumulate a huge amount of cash reserve because of its favorable trade balance. It's gonna plow that money back into society, into infrastructure and into its industries. Japan was a mercantilist nation after 1945 and it to a large extent is one today. We originally were a mercantilist nation. When the United States was young, when we did not have an industry that could compete with the Europeans, we largely adopted these mercantilist anti-capitalist strategies. But after World War II, a very careful calculation resulted in the decision for the United States to not only fully embrace capitalism and free trade, but to make it mandatory for all countries in the world. Adam Smith is of course the father of modern capitalism. And it was through the spirit of Adam Smith and people like David Ricardo who argued for free trade that the United States informed the world here at Bretton Woods in 1944 that the new global economic system would be fundamentally different than in the past. Many of the delegates, representatives from other countries, allies of the United States truly could not believe their ears when they learned that the dominant power was going to open its economy for their trade, but it was not going to demand initially that they do the same. We were going to allow them a process of opening up over time. 
and most of them have done so, though others, Japan and China most notably, have been extremely reluctant to open up their boundaries to genuinely fair and free competition. It's called the liberal economic order, and it was introduced on an international scale. Here's the thinking. A collection of nation states, some of them take to trading with each other, exchanging commodities, goods, and even services. And in so doing, they begin to form an informal security community. There's a cost benefit analysis before any armed intervention. How much is it gonna cost us to invade that country, blood and treasure? And how much are we gonna gain by the war? And it's logical to, to calculate that the more you trade with a country, the higher the cost of going to war with that country because you're gonna lose all of that trade. And generally speaking, we go to war with countries we don't trade with very much. So these nations are trading together. The likelihood of war goes down the more they trade with one another. It essentially changes their character. Countries on the outside, maybe they begin to trade with this group. They see the benefit and they become part of this security community. Others are going to experience higher levels of conflict either with the free trading nations or with themselves. And over time, they may decide we don't like this approach. We prefer to be prosperous as opposed to aggressive. And so they join the trading ranks, conflict diminishes, and the security community expands even further. Two countries on the outside looking in. These are the mercantilist nations. These are the countries that want to trade with all the blue countries but they don't wanna open up their market for competition. Japan and China are classic examples. And what we've decided to do, first with Japan after World War II and with China this century, is to let them in the system anyway, allow them into the free trade system, even though they're not playing by the rules of the game, creating enormous unfair advantage for them. Asia, we talk about, is rising rapidly in world politics, China in particular. It's a little bit of a misnomer. I wouldn't call it the sudden rise of China. I would call it the return of China. Because as a percent of the world economy, Asia 300 years ago was about 65% of the world's economy. Then we have imperialism, colonization, the century of humiliation, by 1950, Asia's percent of the world economy was barely 20%, and today it is roughly 53%, depending on which numbers you're looking at. So we've clearly seen the return of Asia as a major player in global economics. So how did China do it? On a timeline, I would begin with the death of Mao Zedong in 1976. He was an ideologue, he was a communist through and through, he was succeeded by Deng Xiaoping, who was incredibly practical, saying once that it doesn't matter the color of the cat as long as it can catch a mouse. That's the Chinese way of saying, it doesn't really have to be a communist economy. If it works, we'll try other approaches. The Cold War's end in the late 1980s, the rapid opening of global trade markets when the communist international collapsed, the decision to allow China into the World Trade Organization and the very favorable trade terms that were part of the WTO. All of this played an important role in China returning as a dominant player in global economics and in production. Just look at manufacturing. The United States is in blue. This is only a 14 year graph and look at how dramatically we've declined in manufacturing and how rapidly China has more than tripled its share of global manufacturing. So made in China has become something that we've grown greatly accustomed to. I mean, whether we're comfortable with it or not is secondary, it's just a reality that so many articles that we purchase are made in China and so many more products that we purchase are at least partly made in or assembled in the People's Republic of China. 
So we have this global supply chain. And if a significant portion of it is running through one country, through China, then that gives that country enormous amounts of leverage. Exemplary, rare earth metals. They are called that because these 17 to 35 minerals are found in low concentrations in the ground. You have to scoop up a lot of dirt and sift through it to find enough rare earth metals to be used on the market, but they're used everywhere in industry and in automobiles and glasses. I mean, virtually everything that's sophisticated is going to need a rare earth mineral. China produces 85% of the world's rare earth metals. And as a result of that, the whole world is dependent upon China allowing this supply to continue unfettered. It wasn't always the case. Not that long ago, we were the dominant producer of rare earth metals. And then we saw a rapid decline. One of the reasons environmental concerns and legitimate ones, it is stunningly devastating on the environment to produce rare earth minerals. These are the sorts of scars that do not go away very quickly. Another reason we stopped seeking out rare earth metals here in the US, we could always buy them from China, which reflects something of a short-sightedness. China, on the other hand, has become the dominant provider of rare earth metals, in part because the government said we will become the dominant producer, in part because the Chinese went out to countries around the world and purchase leases and rights to their rare earth fields and a long-term desire for leverage over the rest of the international community. Here you can see the decline of America and the rise of China as it relates to the rare earths. 2010, classic example of using rare earth metals. China and Japan were in a bit of a spat, a diplomatic row. China cut off for a considerable amount of time the shipment of rare earth metals and minerals to Japan, which was harmful to its economy. At any moment, China could turn off the spigot of rare earth minerals. So what are we left with? What are we to do in such a world where we're so highly dependent on other countries for the supply chain that runs through their markets? We have three basic options. The first is renewal of engagement. What we've been doing since 1944, but with even more energy and commitment. Option number two is to decouple, especially from countries like China. And option number three is the adoption of a new industrial policy. Let's begin with renewed engagement. This is certainly the line of least resistance. It's what we're accustomed to. It's what our economic blueprint says to do. Continue to allow the mercantilist to be part of the economic system in the hope that over time it will come to them as a rational option to change their color, to become more and more like us. And I don't mean that ideologically, I certainly don't mean that ethnically or politically, but rather purely economically for them to calculate that they're actually better off if they opened up their borders to foreign competition and join in a meaningful way, the global economic system. That's the re-engagement option. It is reflected in their entry into the World Trade Organization, even though they may not have qualified based upon their mercantilist under Option number two, decoupling of the economies separating from China. This would be a long-term process. And immediately that raises concerns about whether we could pull it off. Because here in the United States, every four or at least every eight years, we tend to get a new party in the White House. And very rarely do they see eye to eye with the departing administration. But this is the sort of policy we would need to pursue for a generation. It unfolds in stages. We begin to shift supply chain to others, not relying upon China as much. Stage two, we begin to apply export restrictions on technology. We already have some, 
we would need to add many, many more because other countries like China, when, when we export technology, they're able to duplicate it. They're not as respectful of intellectual property rights as we would like, and they can take advantage of these technologies. Stage number three, duties, anti-dumping penalties, countervailing penalties. In other words, punish the Chinese or others for not playing by the rules. Stage number four, restricted investment in China or preventing China from investing here in the United States. You can see by this approach, we're gonna decouple from China's economy. That has largely been the strategy that President Trump approached. What are the goals of decoupling? Well, it's not about making up for lost time. To be frank with you, it's about avoiding future losses, more jobs outsourced to Asia, redirecting those jobs back to the United States, but the cost will be significant. Billions of dollars in government assistance would be necessary because we can't just pick up and start producing computer chips at a level that is necessary for the American consumer market. And don't forget the Chinese are gonna countermeasure. They're gonna respond with their own duties, their own quotas, their own tariffs, and their own countervailing policies. In fact, China in some ways is decoupling from the United States. This is the $1.54 trillion Silk Road. These are Chinese investments in the infrastructure of other countries in the region and well beyond, including portions of the Middle East and even Western Europe. So in some ways, the decoupling is well underway. Option number three is adopting a brand new industrial policy. It is deciding from the top that we're going to return as an industrial power in the world. We're gonna reverse our tendency towards a service economy and go back towards industrial production. How do we do that? It will take ages. We can be somewhat ambitious by only targeting certain sectors of the economy. So textiles we're gonna bring back or perhaps steel production, one or the other, we're not going to do it wholesale. We're only gonna find a few narrow industries or we could try to fundamentally reorder our country's infrastructure. I mean, just imagine how impressive it would be if we built from scratch brand new industry from coast to coast. No one in the world would be able to keep up with us. But either way, there's going to be an enormous role for the government. This would be effectively abandoning our capitalist principles. And as long as we're fine with that, then we can go down that route, but we should be cognizant of that. So here we are at a largely free trade nation. If we redirect our industry and our entire economy, we're probably going to become a mercantilist country with the option of returning back to somewhere near center point after that reorganization has been completed. We can build our own cars. I have no doubt about that. We can make every single part of a car here in the United States. The question is, do we want to? Would society accept that? Keeping in mind that the cost would suddenly skyrocket because we can't produce many of the parts of a car here that can be produced in Brazil in Saudi Arabia, in South Africa, in China, and then think about the luxury side of it. There's no way we can produce enough computer chips. So is everyone okay rolling down their, their own windows like we did in the old days? We're having to actually reach and turn the dial to make the lights go on instead of them being automatic. Every one of these luxurious aspects of a car requires a computer chip. The impact on a place like Walmart, and in fact, all low budget retailers rely so much on cheap Chinese and foreign imports to be able to sell to the public and recognize a profit. I mean, Walmart is one of the largest hirers in the world. And if we're going to go all domestic, the price of everything in Walmart is going to go up and go up significantly and forget about Dollar General anymore. That just would not be an option. 
we can make our own iPhones. We don't need foreign products. We don't need foreign assembly, but it means an iPhone would cost over $2,000. Would the American public be okay with that? Would they be willing to pay two grand for a new iPhone knowing that they're helping to redeploy Americans? I'm not so sure of it. I think our patriotism to economics and jobs are our neighbor are greatly limited by our price sensitivity to the commodities that we want at a very competitive price. price. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, the global supply chain, the fact that we are greatly dependent on other countries, China in particular, for so many of the products that we purchase and consume, and our three options. This is truly a great decision for our country. What will be fascinating is watching the United Kingdom unfold. I mean, this isn't quite like a decoupling or an industrial readaptation, but the United Kingdom has decided to leave the European Union. And in so doing, it's justified that by saying, we're gonna save jobs here at home. We're going to redirect traditional jobs in fishing, in mining, in agriculture, back into the UK. And of course, Brexit is one of our great decisions for 2021. We'll look at it in more detail in a few weeks, but it will be fascinating over the coming years to see if Brexit really does work out for the Brits or if they will miss those very smooth trade relations with the 500 million people who live on the European continent that are members of the European Union. That completes our very first great decision of 2021. This is a masterclass. There are seven more lectures. They will be held on Wednesdays at 6 p.m. One week from today, we will look at Persian Gulf security. It's been a pleasure of the Foreign Policy Association to deliver this first lecture free of charge. Moving forward from lecture two through eight, there will be a rather modest $7 subscription fee for each lecture that helps us offset the cost of producing this lecture series in staff hours and in platform rentals. We certainly hope that does not deter you from joining us for the rest of the series. We would like for you to follow us on Facebook at Foreign Policy Association or on Twitter at FPA underscore org and at Real Dr. Morton. I'm now going to turn to the Q&A to address some of your questions. If a supply chain is to be collaborative, can it work with a lack of trust? Trust is a very interesting word, Fred. It's something that I hear a great deal in my field of international law. How can you reach agreements with countries that you do not trust? Well, the answer is, World politics isn't based on trust. It is based on rational calculations. What is good for my nation? What is bad for my nation? And how does the cost benefit analysis turn out? So it's not so much about having another country trust you and vice versa. It's rather them convincing themselves it's in their best interest to keep the supply chain open, to allow for the movement of goods, components, and services. I would also add to that a very healthy dose of deterrence wouldn't hurt, meaning, well, if China wants to cut off rare earth minerals to the US, if we had something equally valuable that we could threaten to turn off the spigot going to China, then we would have a deterrent capability. And I do believe in some bare knuckling from time to time. Mickey Canner was our trade advisor in the Clinton administration. He took the gloves off with Japan. He made it clear to them, you will open your market for many of our goods or luxury car parts will not flow out of Japan into the United States. And it was a policy that was successful. Thank you, Sarah. How will President Biden Biden's make in America disrupt global supply chains? Well, first of all, it remains to be seen if that is any more than a political slogan. He may be genuine. His, des his desire to build back better, as he calls it, may be a genuine desire and it may turn into policy. That remains to be seen. 
is a lot easier to say it politically than it is to make it happen on the ground. So we're going to have to have buy-in by the American public. From Jeffrey, shouldn't the U.S. government require a supply chain security plan as part of the contracting process with nodes in other countries? I think that is an excellent suggestion, and I have heard some discussion about exactly that. The question is whether or not we can pull it off in all of the distinct areas that we're trading with other nations. Would it be a comprehensive supply chain security plan that deals with China in general, or would you need individual plans for individual commodities? From Jennifer, how does the US determine the items we do not need to produce in mass inside the United States? In what ways will this now change given COVID and that pandemic crisis that has revealed some of these challenges? The beauty of capitalism is that you don't need central planning, that the market determines winners and losers and demand creates supply. So it's not as if we're aggregately deciding what we do and don't need to produce in the US according to our free trade mantra and capitalism, that's decided by people on the ground. And that's why capitalism is such a decentralizing and alluring economic philosophy. But you're right, Jennifer, if we decide to become more mercantilist, to redirect our production here at home, then we will have to decide what exactly we do need and do not need to produce. And what we're likely to do is base that on a combination of national security and the size of jobs that will be produced. Because at the end of the day, there's always a new election on the horizon and you want to be able to deliver the good news to your constituents. One more question, how will the increasing tensions with China affect the supply chain of products and increase the cost for the public? I don't think that tensions with China are a given to increase. That's up to us. We as the dominant power are looking at China as a rising power. That doesn't mean it's automatically a rising threat. I know it's very common in the United States to say China is automatically a rising threat to American global leadership. And I will speak about this in much more detail in the eighth and final lecture in the series, but we are largely going to determine the extent of increased tensions between China and the United States. I want to thank you all for joining us this evening. We do hope that you enjoyed this lecture. We hope that it provided you with some thoughts and stimulation of conversation to help you make the best decisions possible. Thank you and good evening.